Well, if I, if I told you that you had to lose one of your senses and you got to choose which of your senses to lose, it would be hearing because that was really loud. <clears throat> Most of you would probably choose to give up your sense of smell, especially compared to vision or, or hearing. The sense of smell is, is, is a very subtle sense in our, in our world. We, it's sort of a background sense. We don't spend a whole lot of time uh, attending to smells. It's very rare that it's in the front of our, of our attention. And yet, smell, as we've heard already, but, but as, I'll, as I'll emphasize now, is, is really sort of throughout our, our world and affects a, a variety of different aspects of our behavior. We're surrounded by this soup of smells, especially in a warm auditorium like this. <clears throat> and, and we're continually sampling the air. It's a byproduct of breathing. So the first take-home message is, is continue to breathe. Try to do that every day. It's, a, it's fairly desirable. But, but so, so we're surrounded by these smells. And what, what smells? What, what, what are we smelling? There's a, a number of things that, that, that range from flowers to food to, to folks to, to other things. And, and, and we s actually like to have a lot of smells in our environment. So if you think about uh, flowers, uh, flowers are a nice scent. But not only flowers uh, have a nice scent, but we choose to spend billions of dollars a year as a planet on fragrances that we add to everything from soap to shampoo to new cars to, uh, to perfumes. And so we really seem to value having odors. And that's been around in human culture for thousands of years, where we've tried to add scents uh, and, and odors to our environment. Food, as you probably know, the majority of what you experience as flavor uh, is your sense of smell. Your tongue is telling you whether something sweet or sour or salty or some other things. But your sense of smell is telling you uh, the difference between a camembert and a brie. So really, the richness of, of what we consider flavor is is olfaction. And losing your sense of smell, as you've chosen to do apparently, losing your sense of smell actually can have a big impact on, no, on nutrition. Those foods that you used to really love the flavor are, of uh, just don't excite you much anymore. People smell. Uh, we now know that. Uh, we, can, we can extract information about, about hygiene. I really should have showered today. Um, but we can also uh, identify uh, other individuals from the sense of, scent of smell, sense of smell. Uh, mothers can identify t-shirts that were worn by their babies uh, compared to the, to the t-shirts worn by other babies. And in fact, it goes the other way. The baby can learn the odor of their mother within a very short time and, and discriminate her odor from, from the mother, uh, odors of, of other mothers. Odors are also important in that, or important enough that we use them to tell us things uh, that we should be afraid of, like, like fearful odors. So I can, it's almost like a superpower, I can know that this milk is spoiled without even having to look at it. I can do a chemical analysis and know that it's, that it's gone bad and that I shouldn't consume it. We add uh, contaminants to natural gas, specifically so that we can smell the natural gas and know whether it's on and, and know whether there's a danger. So, so we use odors impact us in a variety of different ways, even though it's not always at the, at the forefront for our attention. And it seems like olfaction should be a relatively simple sensory system. I have a cup of coffee, I inhale a, a molecule of coffee, it binds to some receptor, and, and then I know, okay, I've smelled, I've smelled coffee. But unfortunately, in biology, uh, things are more complicated. And when you smell a cup of coffee, uh, that aroma is not actually due to a single molecule, but it's due to a very complex mixture. Most of the things that you smell um, are due to uh, a variety of different molecules in that stimulus. Uh, so there may be 600 to 800 different volatile molecules in roasted coffee. Okay, not all of those are equally important to, to our percept of coffee but they contribute to our perception of this thing called coffee. Now, we don't smell this, like there's a really good aldehyde or a ketone in my coffee today. We smell an odor object. We smell coffee as a whole. Uh, uh, what our brain does is to synthesize those different features into an object, a perceptual object called coffee. Okay. And once we've synthesized, once we smell that coffee, we don't actually even have conscious access to these other individual components. Somehow our brain has synthesized all these components that we've inhaled 
and created an object. Now this, this process happens in a, most sensory systems. It's called uh, uh, object uh, synthesis, and it's dependent on a process called pattern recognition. So it's difficult for me to give examples of pattern recognition in olfaction, so what I'm going to do is use, is use um, a visual examples. So here's an example of a visual stimulus. Let's say it's a, it's a three-dimensional object out there in the world. Light is reflecting off of that object. It's hitting our retina, and our retina is responding to that light. But the retina can't tell you that you're seeing a nose in this case. What the retina does is it essentially pixelates that image, much like your digital camera does. It's got cells in it that are responding to individual points of light, and it's providing information about whether that pixel is light or dark, maybe something about its wavelength. And so at that point, we don't really have enough information to say what it is we're seeing, but we have some basic information about spots of light. That information is fed forward in the visual system to the back of the brain to the visual cortex, where now we have neurons that are responding to combinations of input from these different pixels, and we have cells that are maximally responsive, really get excited if there's a, 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 a row of pixels all lit up, suggesting maybe there's a contrast edge or a, or a line of a certain length or a certain angle. Okay, so we can start extracting higher order features from this pixel information because of the, the, the processing through the, the, um, the visual pathway. And once we get enough features, then even higher parts of the visual cortex can say, hey, you know, this is a combination of features. This is a pattern that I've seen before. This is, this is in this case, a nose. Okay? It's not exactly the same thing that I've seen before, but it's got enough of the features that I can recognize this pattern. Our brains are phenomenal pattern recognition devices. We, we use pattern recognition uh, to, to, to make sense of, of spatial combinations of features, also temporal combinations of features. So if you hear the first few notes of your favorite song, you will be able to predict what the next series of notes will be over time. Pattern recognition thus allows us to predict the future and make sense of really complicated sets of information. And that's really what we're spending most of our time in, in wandering through the environment. We're deluged by information. We need to be able to make it uh, somehow organized. And pattern recognition allows, allows us to do that. In fact, we're so good at pattern recognition that we can see patterns sometimes even when they're not there. <clears throat> For example, as you can see here, we can, see, we can see faces on Mars, although there's probably not a face on Mars. We can see Jesus on toast, <clears throat> although Jesus is not actually on that toast. So our brains are sort of hungry for patterns, and these visual examples uh, show that pretty well. But this is also happening in the olfactory system. In fact, the, the parts of the olfactory system that are doing this have evolved much earlier than your visual cortex. So the olfactory cortex is, has, has emerged, uh, has evolved much earlier than visual cortex. So some of the things that I'm using the visual system to describe have potentially been sort of stolen from the olfactory system. So one of the important things about um, olfactory, uh, uh, about, about pattern recognition is that word recognition. Recognition means that I've seen this before. It's familiar to me. There's a pattern here that I, that I have some memory of. And, and in fact, this places memory at the heart of perception. And here's an example of this. If you've never seen this image before, it means you've never seen me talk before. Um, but it also means that, that in a few minutes, I'm going to literally change your brain. So if that concerns you, uh, please look away. Here's an image with a bunch of little black dots, uh, little splotches of different size. Uh, and you can, and uh, you, we can imagine each one of these is, is, is a feature. There's no particular pattern in, the, in, in this case. We just see these different features. But if I have some of those features move coherently, which is a, an important thing for the visual system to do, you can fairly rapidly learn that some of those features, some of that pattern needs to be put together into an object against a background. And if you've never seen this before, I can guarantee that if I come back a year from now, you'll be able to see this picture and that and that pattern will still pop out. I've placed in your brain, in a really se uh, literal sense, a, a pattern that you're now able to, to, to use to organize this, this complex stimulus. Well, the same thing happens, a very similar process happens in the olfactory system. So here's our nose and, and this cup of coffee. And remember, the cup of coffee is, is giving off a variety of different volatile molecules. 
We inhale those, they go up and they bind to receptors in your nose. And because of remarkable uh, anatomical wiring in, in the olfactory system, those uh, uh, different uh, molecules uh, induce a very specific spatial pattern of activity in the first part of the olfactory system, the olfactory bulb. And so these, uh, uh, these odors will activate a unique pattern of activity in the initial parts of the olfactory system, and then your olfactory cortex, which is shown here sort of deep in the brain, at the bottom of the brain, in, in, the, in the bright red circles. That's where we perform pattern recognition. I'm recognizing this pattern of, re of, of receptor activation because of this combination of features I've just inhaled, and I, I end up with, with this uh, percept. Now, what's the advantage or what's the adaptive advantage of having such a system? Wouldn't it be a lot simpler to just have a single receptor that, um, that turns on uh, when we smell a particular thing? Wouldn't it be a lot simpler to have a coffee receptor? Uh, well, we can't have a single coffee receptor because, as I mentioned, most of the odors that you experience are complex mixtures. But the other uh, advantage of having a system like this is it gives tremendous flexibility to the system. It means that that I don't have to have a labeled line for coffee, meaning that I don't have to have a single receptor that every time it's turned on, I, I smell coffee. Rather, um, I, can I can build representations of a variety of different odors. So let's again go back to the visual system. And here's a, uh, here's a car, okay? Let's have a visual system that's designed or has evolved to deal with cars. And I have a single receptor, a single labeled line receptor to deal with cars that look just like this. Now, if I have a different car come along, I'm not going to be able to recognize that if I, if I have a dedicated labeled line system. But if I have a system that's, that's dealing with at the level of features and learned patterns, then as long as I have the sim a similar kinds of features, I can recognize lots of different cars. Okay, so it gives me great, very, uh, great flexibility, and it gives me almost an unlimited number of things that I can smell. Okay, we can come up with a new molecule that has never been smelled before, and we'll be able to deal with that because we can break it into its features and, and develop new templates for that, for that stimulus. The other thing about, about having a, a system like this is we can learn to smell. We can improve or impair our ability to make sensory discriminations with training. We can train our brain. Um, so if, if initially I, I smell uh, flowers and I can't really tell the difference between those different kinds of flowers, um, my brain may not be doing a very good job of, of discriminating these similar patterns. But let's say I develop an allergy to one kind of flower and I really love eating other kinds of flowers, it may be to my advantage to fine-tune those representations, fine-tune those, those templates or those patterns I have stored in my olfactory cortex, so that now, even though they're very similar, I can choose to eat some flowers and avoid other flowers. Okay, so I can improve my ability to make sensory discriminations. The other, th the other side of the coin is also true. Uh, if I don't really pay a whole lot of attention between the difference between the aroma of Stella and Heineken, I can actually cause my olfactory cortex to lose its ability to make that discrimination. Okay, so I can, I can untrain my brain and begin to generalize between stimuli that I probably should be able to make a discrimination. What's a downside of a system that's, that's, that's based on, a uh, perceptual system that's based on memory? It's based on memory. And that can be a problem if we have problems with memory. There's a number of different disorders that impair your memory, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, a number of other things. And it's known now that impairments in odor identification and the sense of smell are very early uh, precursors to the onset of Alzheimer's. In fact, if you have, if you have some mild cognitive impairment uh, and also have a difficulty in identifying odors, you have a fairly high probability of that cognitive impairment progressing to Alzheimer's disease. If you have mild cognitive impairment and your sense of smell is just fine, it's a much lower uh, probability that you will progress to Alzheimer's disease. So something about olfaction, and we think uh, this, this dependence on plasticity of the nervous system and memory um, makes it very sensitive to a variety of different, order, uh, different disorders. So what can you do about it? Um, you can't really prevent uh, uh, Alzheimer's by training your nose, but what I would encourage you to do is bring olfaction to the forefront of your attention, at least occasionally. When you go home tonight, pay attention to the aromas of the, of the food on your table, the products in your cupboard. People have spent billions of dollars developing those fragrances. Use them. 
um, and, and really stop occasionally and literally smell the roses. Uh, it, it will change your brain. Thank you.